When I became a Christian, I quickly realized that to um, love like Jesus, to learn to love like Jesus, um, was the responsibility uh, of getting that of one person. And that one person was me. I accepted Jesus Christ when I was a sophomore in high school. And it was nobody else's responsibility to ensure that I was growing in Jesus Christ except me. It was 100% it was totally my responsibility. I was responsible to read the Bible, to pray, uh, to learn about Jesus. Uh, nobody else accepted Christ on my behalf. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Um, and even if I had, my parents couldn't accept Jesus for me. There were no teachers or preachers or anybody else who could give me my faith. I had to discover it for myself. And when I was all born in high school, uh, I did. And I was and still am totally responsible for my spiritual growth. However, I needed tools. I needed support. I needed other people to help me. So one of the very first tools I got was a King James Version Bible. <coughs> As a sophomore in high school in 1974, um, not the smartest kid on the block by a long shot, it was probably the wrong version to get, especially in the same month that I accepted Christ going to a youth convention with 900 people. Uh, and all the other kids were carrying this green hardback covered Bible. And uh, so I went and told my mom, Mom, I, there's something wrong with my Bible. The words are funny. I don't quite get it and understand. But these other kids have this Bible called the Living Bible. The Living Bible was a paraphrase. It was kind of the first popular ones of those. A paraphrase is like you read a chapter or a paragraph from the Bible and then you put it in your own words. So it's not the best for in-depth study, but for just getting God's word and kind of understanding it for yourself. It's a great thing to have. And I just devoured God's Word. I took it with me everywhere once I accepted Christ. I, I sh probably shouldn't have by the teacher's standard, but I was always reading in class. Um, uh, I would take it anywhere we went on a trip or something. I, I had the Bible with me constantly. didn't just have it, but I was always, always reading it. Now, some people grow most by prayer when they first accept Christ. Some, by fellowship of other Christians, they draw their strength and understanding from that. Um, some people from just different spiritual disciplines. For me, it was God's Word. And I not only read it, but I went to Sunday school. I went to um, youth group where we did more study of God's Word. I went to Wednesday night Bible study with all these elderly ladies who were way ahead of their time because most of them had blue hair. <laughs> We started having Bible studies in our home, the youth group. Not, and they weren't sponsored by the church. They weren't sponsored by any kind of youth advisor or anything. We just said, hey, let's get together. Let's read the Bible and talk about what it says to us. And we had a couple of those a week. Then me and my friends started Bible study at school, of all places, in a city public high school. You say, well, gosh, today that wouldn't be allowed. Well, certainly it would be. If students are doing it, it's perfectly all right, and we did. Um, then if that wasn't enough, uh, I started getting really involved on a state and region level in some youth leadership, some peer-to-peer -peer stuff, and started teaching others uh, the Bible more and more. And everybody knows that when you teach, you learn more than anybody. Uh, it's one of the greatest things. I. It, it always amazes me when there's a, maybe a Sunday school class that's been meeting for 60 years, and there's people who've been in there for 60 years, and the teacher steps aside for whatever reason. You say, okay, well, who's going to teach now? And you can't find a volunteer. Uh, all it means is you're going to learn more. It, it doesn't mean you have to have some mad teaching skills. You just have to love Jesus and his word and, and want to open it and share it with others. And so... Uh, I had tools, I had support, I had other people. I was responsible. I had to show up to church every Sunday. And back then it was every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday night, right, at least. And then I married this tremendous, beautiful Christian girl 34 years ago, who she had a very different experience than me. 
and then she grew up in the church. She grew up knowing, knowing Jesus. However, by the time she got to high school as well, we shared a lot of similar experiences and discovered that our faith was very much the same. We became very good friends, even though we lived about an hour apart. Um, but we went to some of the same camps, and then she also got involved in the state region uh, leadership stuff. And so we were going to other churches uh, for a weekend, overnighters, and doing this peer-to-peer -peer, uh, teaching of God's Word. Um, I and she too then getting involved in teaching through dramas and musicals and a whole lot of other ways. And it was our responsibility then that once we had not one but two children, to teach those children the love of God and how to love like Jesus loves. It was not their responsibility. Whereas when I accepted Jesus, it was my responsibility. When we had children, that was our responsibility, not theirs. Why? Well, because... Even if their stroller, and I have to be a little bit older for this, even if their stroller was tricked out by Tim the Tool Man Taylor, uh, somebody else still had to get to the church. Uh, they're not going to get there by themselves. And so it was our responsibility to see that they were at church every <coughs> Sunday, that they went to Sunday school, that they were well taught. And if they weren't well taught, if the church didn't provide the things, then we would help make sure uh, that they were well taught at church as well as at home. It was our responsibility. They couldn't read the Bible for themselves, so we would read the Bible to them, a little children's Bible. We'd tell them Bible stories. We would sing songs to them, Christian songs. It was our responsibility to teach them that Jesus loves them. And then eventually to teach them how to love like Jesus loved. And it is still our responsibility. We're not primarily responsible for them because the moment that Nathan and Gretchen gave the hearts to Jesus, who was primarily responsible? They were. They were. But we still have a responsibility. Um, I can't imagine having uh, Christian parents more on the ball with faith than Gary and Gretchen, and so Gideon is in good hands, my grandson. He is in good hands. Um, he's going to be taught uh, how much Jesus loves him, and how to love like Jesus loves. Um, but I've discovered I've got another responsibility. I am also a part of their support system to help teach this beautiful child uh, how much Jesus loves him. Here's one of the ways, and I've shared it with you before, um, how I took this responsibility seriously with my kids. And, and it's very appropriate for today, what my son told me yesterday. Um, our kids, uh, they were never required to go to church, but they would have never thought about it any other way. I, I mean, you know, once they got to a certain age, they maybe could have said, oh, I don't want to go anymore. Um, we never got to that. I'm very thankful for that. Some of you have experienced that. You know, no matter, you can do everything right, and your kids can still go a different direction, right? Everybody is responsible for themselves at some point, okay? We're responsible, but they finally make their ultimate decision. But for our kids, they didn't see somebody who went to church because it's their job. They saw people who went to church because they love Jesus Christ desperately, and they want to be with his people. And so here's how I know that translated. Not only do my kids rarely, 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 rarely miss church, um, but right after Gretchen had her baby and we were there, it was Palm Sunday. I found out, I didn't know this, that Palm Sunday is Gretchen's favorite Sunday of the year. I didn't know anybody else who Palm Sunday would be their favorite Sunday. Easter, yes. Christmas, yes. Maybe even Fourth of July, if you really like the, the patriotic stuff with your faith. Um, but Palm Sunday, I've never heard that. Well, there's a church in town, American Baptist Church, that starts at 1030. And because Gideon was having some problems, Gretchen was having some problems, physically weren't able, everybody, to go. And I assumed I needed to stay there to help them. Well, they know how important it is for them and certainly how important it is for dad. That if we're not in corporate, corporate worship and hear, hear corporate preaching, we create our own, their entire lives. If there's been a time where we could not physically be at church, we would open the scriptures, we would sing songs, we would pray together, we would make it happen one way or another. So the local American Baptist Church started at 1030. And at 1020, when... I, I don't know if Gary, Gretchen, and Kim talked or whatever and said, look, we got this. They just looked over at me and all of them were like, go, go, go. Like, go on our behalf. Go 
for us. We know you want to go. We're going to be okay here for an hour without you, Dad. <laughs> and so I went to church. I got there just the time as it started, left and went right back to him uh, after it was over. And some people might say, you know, I think the preacher could miss a Sunday when he's on vacation miss going to church, and it would be okay. However, I would say no, because I am responsible for my own spiritual growth. And I feel a desperate desire, like that song, Breathe. I'm just desperate for him, and for being in corporate worship and hearing preaching at least once a week. You think when I'm preaching that I'm doing this for your benefit? It is always first for my own. Don't ever think that I'm doing this because I think you need to hear this. I'm doing it because of my relationship with God and what he's telling me. I'm just kind of talking it out loud in public and let you uh, be a part of it as well. But it's for me because I need it. I need it for my own spiritual <coughs> growth. And I need it then. The reason I said it's appropriate for today, so my son is now a, a sheriff's dispatcher for 911. Okay? He just started this last week. He's in training. He will be working from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., 12-hour shifts. He'll never have to miss church, right? He's never missed church for a job. During his training right now, he's working 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Today, Sunday, he's working 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. How many of you know a church that has a service before 7 a.m. on Sunday? <laughs> How many of you know a church that has a service after 7 p.m. on Sunday? <coughs> He is, he is desperate. He said, Dad, I'm just, I'm looking all over. I'm, I'm online and I'm trying to find somebody who either later tonight or maybe tomorrow, Monday, has some kind of service or something. I just want to be with God's people. At least in this area, I've taught him well, not by what I've said, but by what I've done. Again, they could have chosen to go some other way. So I'm not saying, hey, look, look at me. I'm just saying it from my responsibility, they caught that. That was a good one. And I'm so thankful that they did. And so if anybody knows anything in um, Bowling Green, Ohio, in that area of church that meets on Mondays or something, um, contact my son on Facebook and let him know. Let me move on to this story a little bit. Uh, I have pastored several tremendous churches. I was youth pastor at three different churches. Some of you don't know that. Associate pastor at one. Senior pastor at Owl Creek Baptist Church. That was my first church in Mount Vernon, Ohio, way out in the country. Dirt road for two and a half years. I was senior pastor at First Baptist Church of Urbana, Ohio for 11 years. Uh, the founding pastor, I started a church in 2000. Living Water Community Church, American Baptist Church, in New Albany, Ohio, which is in Columbus. Uh, and it merged after three years with, and I always hated the name of this church, Southwest Licking Community Baptist Church. <laughs> Try putting that on letterhead. And then telling people the name of your church has the word licking in it. I tell people when they ask that we're like cats, we baptize by licking people. <laughs> It was in Licking County uh, in the Southwest Licking School District. So uh, I don't know who thought of the name, but never liked it. Good church, though. Good church. And then for almost nine years, I have pastored here as senior pastor. And on June 1st, we'll begin at Ashland Baptist, formerly Ashland Avenue Baptist Church uh, near Toledo, Ohio. But let me ask, who was responsible for the spiritual growth, the understanding of the Bible, learning how much Jesus loves them and how to love like Jesus in each of those churches I just mentioned. Was I responsible? No. Well, there's a little bit of yes and no to that one. Just like I'm responsible for Jeff Cooper, so each person is responsible for their own spiritual growth. However, I am part of a support system that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus set up, and it's called the church. I'm one part of that support system. Me, along with youth leaders, 
with Sunday school teachers, small group leaders, choir directors, deacons, children's leaders, every member of a local congregation. And I am no more important in that group than any other person. We're all called to do our part, and when someone does not fulfill their part in the work of the ministry, in that support system, somebody is not being taught by word or by example in what it means to be loved by Jesus and to love like Jesus loves. What we do as people of God has eternal consequences, and when we take that responsibility and privilege lightly, we fail to do for others what somebody else did for us. I just want to take this building for example. Now this building, our trustees went through it recently and they discovered we got all kinds of problems with this building. You don't see most of them, but there's a lot of problems with this building because it's old. Um, but I want you to think for a moment. Our church is 111 years old. This building was uh, dedicated in 1951. How many years is that? How many? 65. I can't hear you a lot. Thank you. Um, and think about the people before this building was built. How much money they gave. How much harder cash they worked to make sure that this building was here. How many of you in here helped pay for this building to be here? Anybody? Any of you around long enough? Were you here before 1951? Okay. All right. A couple of you raising your hands. So you help. The rest of us, the rest of us have not paid one cent to make sure this building was here. Now, we maybe have paid to make sure it's still standing, or that it has a new carpet, or something like that. But we didn't pay for it. Somebody else took the responsibility for us. Part of our support system that Jesus established 2,000 years ago, the church. What about us? Think about kids who come through Sunday school. Have you ever prayed for the children who go through this church in Sunday school? Have you ever thought about it? Has it ever crossed your mind? Have you ever prayed for the adults that go to a small group? You know, maybe you don't attend a small group, and you still think, well, that's just not my thing, or you just haven't gotten connected with them. Have you ever prayed for the people who go to a small group? And that can just go on and on and on. Do you know how important it is that you're sitting right where you're sitting this morning? Because there's people around you who would feel an emptiness. Just like these four right here feel an emptiness when the youth get up and go, don't you? It just doesn't feel the same once those bodies leave. It's so important to other people that you're here. It's so important to other people who know you especially. Because they love seeing your face and they love seeing your commitment. We all have a responsibility to do our part. Preaching is my call. It's not the call of most of you here, maybe a few. Maybe you haven't heard it. Maybe you haven't answered it. I don't know. Um, but everybody is responsible to do their part for sharing and teaching the love of Jesus to sinner and saint alike. And all parents are called equally to be responsible for their children. <coughs> Let me read our text for you again. Because I know I've just been sort of telling you a story up to this point, but it has to do with the text. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, we're talking about John the Baptist. Uh, who was John the Baptist? He was the forerunner, right? He was the light that came and shone on Jesus coming. He's the one who said, make a way in the wilderness. Get your heart ready, for the kingdom of heaven is near. That's what John would say. The kingdom of heaven is near. And then he points to Jesus, basically, says that's the name of God, or retranslated, there's the kingdom of God. Right there. He's standing right there and he's about to be baptized. Okay, that's John the Baptist. He's thrown in prison. And at that point, Jesus returns to Galilee. That's the area he grew up. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. So, here's the Sea of Galilee. This is northern Israel. Trying to do this backwards, so I hope this is right. Over here, not right along the shore, but inland a little bit, is Nazareth. A little teeny town of Nazareth. And then way up here at the northern tip of the Sea of Galilee is Capernaum. And Capernaum down almost to Nazareth, a little bit above that, are the areas of Zebulun and Naphtali. Those were two of the twelve tribes of Israel. 
And 700 years prior to Matthew writing these words, the Assyrians had come in, and Zebulun and Naphtali were the first two of the northern kingdom to be taken away into exile. They came in, literally got the people, took them out of the land of Israel, and took them to Assyria as captives. So what? God's presence in that area, the northern and the northwestern portion of the Sea of Galilee, God's presence is taken away because what? God's people are taken away. So now I hear this scripture text in light of that. Because nobody has referred to this land as the land of Zebulun and Naphtali a long time. So Matthew has some reason for that. He wants us to think historically in light of what happened 700 years earlier, in light of who is standing in their midst. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee, leaving Nazareth, he went to live and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. What's Matthew saying? Zebulun and Naphtali, you have been in the shadow of death for 700 years. But right now, right in your midst, a light has dawned. And here's how he says it looks. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. What does repent mean? Turn around. Look at me. Look, you guys, look. Turn toward me, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven, fulfilled in Jesus himself, is in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, in the land of darkness. He is present among them. The king himself, Jesus, is basically a ground zero teaching. Ground zero where that first exile took place 700 years earlier. And he is preaching the good news of the kingdom. However, every person there had their own response. Even though Jesus was preaching, even though the kingdom of heaven was present in him, each person had to be responsible for themselves. And then to become a part of the support system that Jesus would set up, which is called the church. Mark chapter 6. The apostles gathered around Jesus, reported to him all that they had done and taught. What is that saying? That's saying Jesus took these guys, these 12 guys, and he imparted things about the kingdom of God to them and then sent them out to teach. And they went out and shared with people that Jesus couldn't get to. And they came back and they reported to Jesus how it was going. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, how many of you have ever been so busy that you go, oh my gosh, lunch was three hours ago and I just haven't had time to eat. Okay, it happened. Then. Okay, it happened. So it was happening to the disciples. They were so busy. They were sharing the love of Jesus so much. Jesus said, look, you guys are going to burn yourselves out. Come away with me to a quiet place. Let's have lunch together. And let's just sit quietly for a few moments. Because I know that you need that, right? And here's what happened when Jesus says that to him. Um, he says, come with me and rest in a quiet place. So they went away by themselves, got into a boat. That's a good way to be quiet by yourself, you got to a boat, went to a solitary place, meaning a place where nobody is around. There are no picnic tables and grills, no rest side area, just a place where nobody would ever come. Right? But many who saw them leaving, got the boat, saw them leaving, recognized them. Jesus was a rock star at this point. <coughs> and they ran on foot from all the towns. Can you picture this? Jesus and the disciples get in a boat. They're going to go away because Jesus knows they need some quiet time. But they need to rest so they can go back out and share the good news. But people on the shore, they see him, they start telling everybody, you guys, Jesus and the disciples, they're in the boat. Let's go meet them. And, and picture all these people running along the shore. 
And it says, they got there ahead of them. There were no motorboats in these days. So apparently they weren't going very fast because people were running along the shore and got to the solitary place where nobody would want to go because there's nothing there. They got there and waited for Jesus' boat to land. And when Jesus landed, he said, get out of here, you guys. I need some quiet time with my disciples. I can see some of you are looking at your Bible. No, that's not true. When Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd. And he had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. You see, Jesus is never too tired to love us. So what did he do? He began teaching them many things. Jesus was always teaching, always raising up his followers to teach and to love like he loved. This pastor... We'll be leaving this place in about seven weeks. And you'll be getting eventually another teacher or preacher. One as an interim for a while and then somebody else eventually for a longer time. But I've got to tell you that you are the one who is responsible for your spiritual life. You are responsible that during a time of transition that you study the scriptures, that you pray, that you get involved with a Sunday school class, a small group. That you don't take uh, the easy path. In fact, maybe you ought to ramp things up in your spiritual life uh, during this time. Dig in however you can so that you will fully know the love of Jesus. And even more, know how to love like Jesus loves. It's my responsibility to do that for me. In part, still to do it for my kids, but only as a supporting part. To do it for this church, for the next church that I'll be a part of, wherever I am, to do my part, to be a part of the support system. Do you know how important your part is? You think, well, I just come to church on Sunday morning and I go and leave. I'm really not involved in stuff. Do you know how important you are to the work of Jesus Christ? To sharing the love of God with others and how to love like Jesus loves? It is so important to Jesus that you fulfill his plan <clears throat> on your life.
by his mighty power at work within us, is able to do far more than we'd ever dare to ask or even dream of. <coughs> Infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, and hopes. Now glory be to God through the church, through Jesus Christ, throughout all generations, both now and forever. And everybody ready to teach others how much Jesus loves them. Say, Amen.